Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. Once again, we're so glad that you have joined us. In our quick trip through the Bible, we're going to uh, read something in uh, Zephaniah uh, this time. Uh, turn to Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 14. And uh, let's read together. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hastens quickly. The noise of the day of the Lord is bitter. There the mighty men shall cry out that the day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of devastation and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet and alarm against the fortified cities and against the high towers. I will bring distress upon men, and they shall walk like blind men, because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust, and their flesh like refuse. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. For he will make speedy riddance of all those who dwell in the land. Wow. Yeah. Ooh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Zephaniah is having a few, some, a few more words to say about Nineveh and the Assyrians. This is the last time we're going to hear about them because he is down basically just before Nineveh is being wiped out. And Zephaniah is, is, is looking around. He says, Lord, is there any, anybody righteous anywhere? And Zephaniah not only has words to say about Nineveh, he has some pretty strong words to say about even Judah and the nations right around Judah as we'll we might get a chance to see in chapter chapter 2. Let me read you the introduction to Zephaniah in the Message Bible. We humans keep looking for a religion that will give us access to God without having to bother with people. We want to go to God for comfort and inspiration when we're fed up with the men and women and children around us. We want God to give us an edge in the dog-eat-dog -dog competition of daily life. This determination to get ourselves a religion that gives us an inside track with God, but leaves us free to deal with people however we like, is age old. It is a sort of religion that has been promoted and marketed with both zeal and skill throughout human history. Business is always booming. It is also the sort of religion that the biblical prophets are determined to root out. They're dead set against it. Because the root of the solid spiritual life is embedded in a relationship between people and God, it is easy to develop the misunderstanding that my spiritual life is something personal between me and God, a private thing to be nurtured by prayers and singing, spiritual readings that comfort and inspire and worship with like-minded friends. If we think this way for very long, we will assume that the way we treat the people we don't like or who don't like us has nothing to do with God. That's when the prophets step in and interrupt us, insisting everything you do or think or feel has to do with God. Every person you meet has to do with God. We live in a vast world of interconnectedness and the connections have consequences, either in things or in people, and all the consequences come together in God. The biblical phrase for the coming together of the consequences is judgment day, the day of the Lord. We can't be reminded too often or too forcefully of this reckoning. Of this reckoning, Zephaniah's voice in the choir of prophets sustains the intensity and the urgency. So Zephaniah is saying, 
in case you didn't get the message, I'm standing on the street corner and I'm jumping up and down and I'm shouting because the destruction is right on us. But what is his message? Yeah. You faithful come out, isn't it? Yeah. Very similar to the message in Revelation, come out of her, my people. Where, where is it's he, a message of separation. Where is he asking the faithful to come to? Because it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. and Where are they going to go? Yeah, where yeah. are they going to go, the faithful? Seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth, who have upheld his justice. Seek righteousness. Seek humility. It may be that you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It may be. It may be. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. Unfortunately, when... Well, the just shall live by faith that it will be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and even if you die, remember that death, this first death that we're talking about here, is only asleep in God's eyes. Yeah. Right. And if you die in some kind of conflagration or or some kind of a terrible accident or something that you had no control over, God God is still there. He hasn't forgotten about you. Right. Yeah. That's that's a pretty ultimate test is th yeah. that faith keeps holding on even even when the blade comes for you. But that's exactly what those who are going to be translated will have to go through. Mm -hmm. They will have to hang on by faith, <coughs> even though it looks like they're going to die in doing it. Well, that doesn't look very nice. I thought, I thought all this was it's, good news. It's, it's <laughs> Tell me where the good news is. The next verse. Yeah, the next verse. <laughs> yeah. Well, he starts out and he says, boy, I have, I have doom for Gaza. I have doom for Moab. I have doom for Ammon. And he goes down the, down the list, doom for Assyria. Jerusalem is doomed, chapter 3, tells about the corruption there. The Lord says, I have wiped out whole nations. I have destroyed their cities and left their walls and towers um, in ruins. Just wait, wait for the day of the Lord. And then verse 13, the people of Israel who survive will do no wrong to anyone, tell no lies, nor try to deceive. They will be prosperous and secure, afraid of no one. In other words, what kind of people are going to survive? Righteous. The meek. The righteous people. Okay? So, look at... It doesn't at, say how you're going to survive, but you will survive. Yeah. Look at Zephaniah 1, 12. We're going to bounce back and forth a little bit in this book. What do you think would lead somebody to say something like this? At that time, I will take a lamp and search Jerusalem. I will punish the people who are self-satisfied and confident, who say to themselves, the Lord never does anything one way or the other. Does it sound like uh, that would be the right thing to say at a time like this? Not really. Do some of you have a different translation of that? Maybe something's wrong with my translation. The Lord will do nothing, either good or bad. That sounds like what I read. Yeah, it is. <laughs> different words. Is he saying that the Lord will punish the lukewarm um, people? Well, think who of the context once again. The Babylonians are coming, sweeping down from the north, and you're saying... He just lets it happen, what he's well, doing. Yeah. He's just not going to intervene. He's not going to uh, stop, stop it. it. And he's just going to let things run his course. What... what it's really a punishment for this to come on a faithless person. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, that's got to be the ultimate, shouldn't it be? Mm -hmm. But the faith, the, the faith of the people will be tested to the uttermost. Mm -hmm. Okay. So why do you suppose people are saying God's not going to do anything? Why would they want to say such a thing at this point? Because it doesn't look like he's going to do anything. When we're well, what, what's happening is they're, they are, and if, if you go back to Jeremiah, if you go back to Ezekiel, they are doing all kinds of terribly awful, wicked things inside the temple walls. They're worshiping pagan idols inside the temple grounds itself. And what are they saying? God didn't this is that. God's temple. Nothing's going to happen to us because God wouldn't 
there's no way God could let anything happen to Solomon's temple here. I mean, didn't God give us the plans for it? Didn't he bring all this? I mean, this is the, one of the marvels of the ancient world. God will never allow anything to happen. Read Jeremiah 7. And so what are, they, what are the people saying? Well, we just stick by here close to his, his temple and we'll be just fine. God's not going to do anything to us. Even though they did terrible things inside the, the temple yeah. and nothing so, else. But, but, you know, this is kind of like a false insurance, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Because they go in there and do anything they want in the temple. See, nothing's happening to us. Yep. We can do anything we want. Yep. It's God's kind of a false assurance. Sometimes I wonder if any assurance is really helps. Similar to you chapter know. 3 of uh, Second Peter. Yeah. Yeah, things are just keep going on and on. Nothing's going to change. Read that for a moment because that, that's very relevant to us. Or, or I can if you want to. Start. You want to start with verse 10? Uh, chapter 3, Second Peter 3, verse 3, isn't it? Oh, you wanted a 3 or? Well, it's at, uh, first of all, you must understand yeah. this, that scoffers will come in the last days, scoffing, following their own passions and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things have continued as they were from the beginning. Yeah. And so on and so forth. Yeah, exactly. And he's, the response is the same. Look at verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Yeah. On that day, the heavens will disappear with a shrill noise. The heavenly bodies will burn up and be destroyed. The earth with everything in it will vanish. Since all these things will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people should you be? Not people standing out like in Zephaniah's day. God's not going to do anything. He's not going to do anything good. He's not going to do anything bad. Don't worry. Kind of like the flood before the flood. Yeah. When Zephaniah was writing this, did he realize he was not only writing for the people of his day, but he was writing for the people of a future near the day of the Lord? Who are those people? You know anything about those people? I think idea. it just worked out that way. <laughs> it's worked out. I don't cycles, know. Cycles, cycles. I think the Message Bible puts it very succinctly. I'll find and punish those who are sitting it out fat and lazy, amusing themselves and taking it easy, who think God doesn't do anything good or bad. He isn't involved, so neither are we. Yep. There you go. The RSV says, I will punish the men who are thickening up upon their lees, <laughs> and those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do it. <laughs> yeah. You well, know, whether that's just true or fat. false, it's going to seem that way. Mm -hmm. It is going to seem that way. And so, you know, do you think that faith is, is assurance or is faith a different animal than just assurance? Is, is it something sl different than that? What's it? I, Though he slay me, I won't do anything. How do you, you, how to, do you, how do you have insurance, assurance and then have this, this war of faith the, inside? The best example of that is what happened to the disciples between, between crucifixion and Pentecost. Peter, before the crucifixion, here he is, the, la the maid points at him. He says, oh, no, not me. I don't know anything about this man. I've never heard of him before. I'll swear to it. And after that, Acts, well, just, just read it. Look at Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Acts chapter 4, verse 13. And you can see what happened. The members of the council, now Peter and John have been arrested. And they've been told, never, never, never are you to speak about this Jesus ever again. And Peter stands up and he says, The members of the council were amazed to see how bold Peter and John were and to learn that they were ordinary men of no education. They realized then that they had been companions of Jesus. And when those, when those men, when those disciples finally realized, you know what? That guy that we were walking around with for three and a half years is God. And they just, it, it blew them away. It just blew them away. They said, you know, we know what kind of a person he is. We got to know him really well. If, if we go out here, we can go out and do anything we want. And if he wants, if he wants us to do that, if we're following his directions, if we're his guidance, he will protect us. And if it's time for us to die, it won't matter because he'll take care of us after we're dead. That's now, an exercise of faith. That's it, an it exercise is, of no faith. There's no assurance. I mean, it's, it's not a promise of a reward or, th or done through a threat of punishment. But after you've seen him come along and, and raise people from the yeah, dead, even after they've powerful. been dead for four years, <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, four days, it's a pretty powerful. Yeah. Now, isn't it easier for the disciples to have faith 
who walked and talked with Jesus than us today? Look well, what they went through. Yeah, look what they look went what, through. But we have. on the other hand, they didn't have a copy of this Bible to, to take home with them, to look at, to read, to study. They didn't have all the history of the Christian church from their day to ours. We've got all that. So that's our living evidence. Yeah, and if we don't like the version we're reading, we can get a different version. I think we'll find out that the, the difficulty for faith is going to be spread out pretty even no matter where you're at, at what time. Yeah, yeah. So. the human heart's pretty constant. Right. Mm -hmm. One of the big things that, that Zephaniah talks about, and it's translated a little bit differently in different, different versions, is this day of the Lord. What does the day of the Lord mean? Now, we had that back in Joel when we talked about it, the day of the Lord. What, what does the day of the Lord mean? Day when the Lord is on the move. Yep. Doesn't that mean the very <laughs> last day of earth? Would you say the day of the Lord happened when the flood happened? Yes. For those people. For those people? Yes. Would you say that the day of the Lord had come when uh, there was a drought in Judah? That's what Joel said. Certainly in that economy it was. Yeah. Yeah. So what does the day of the Lord mean? Does it mean that is a day that the Lord is working? Okay, the Lord is doing something anyway, right? It's a uh, day when he's very apparent. No, very apparent. Okay. <laughs> okay. Might be said a little bit subtly. It's the conclusion but. of another phase of history. Yeah. There's a very interesting shift that, went, that took place in this uh, concept of the day of the Lord from Old Testament times coming down to New Testament times. You know what that shift was? In Old Testament times, in the days of David and Solomon, if you said the day of the Lord, they said, yes. You know, behind David and Solomon, we can beat any nation in the world. We're going to conquer the world. We're going to be the biggest nation of all. We're going to rule. And that's what the day of the Lord meant to them. But then as the nation deteriorated after Solomon, it broke in two and it went through all these things. And finally, they went off into captivity. The northern ten tribes went into Assyrian oblivion. And the, the southern tribes, they went off into Babylonian captivity. And suddenly, when you, there you are in Babylonian captivity. And you say, hey, brother, you remember that Day of the Lord stuff? <laughs> what happened? We were supposed to be ruling the world, right? And when a small group, about 1 or 2% of them, came back to Jerusalem, and Ezra, who we're going to study about in a little while, started talking to them about putting the Bible together, and, and looking at all of God's words, they started thinking about what the Bible had said. And, and the first sort of Old Testament, well, the first sort of Bible that anybody knew anything about really put together was in probably in Ezra's day. And he put all this stuff together and he was reading it to them. And they finally said, you know, what do we have left that's of any greatness at all? This is what we have, the Bible. It's, I mean, we're, we're a, a handful of people. We're never going to conquer the world as this handful of people. Obviously, God has put us through a lot of trouble. So what could the day of the Lord mean to us? And over time, they gradually developed this idea between the Old Testament and the New Testament, developed the idea that things are getting worse, and they're going to get worse and worse and worse, and there's going to be powerful nations arising around us, and who knows gonna, who's going to come down next. But someday... The Messiah is going to come. And when the Messiah comes, he's going to fix everything. And that will be the day of the Lord. So if you ask a Christian in the 21st century, what does it mean when we say the day of the Lord? What are they likely to say? Probably talking about the second coming. Probably talk about the second coming. Are we more like the the Jews before the Babylonian captivity or the Jews after the Babylonian captivity? You know, there's still kind of a component that's the same. Mm -hmm. that. Yeah, yeah. Not I'm not exactly yeah. the same, but yeah. there is a component that runs through them both mm -hmm. as far as think, the day of the Lord comes. I think in our day there's more of a galactic finality. Mm -hmm. Some people have no clue, but there are more and more people realizing Things are not what they were. Mm -hmm. There's a change, a definite deep change. Yeah. Yeah. And it looks like, I mean, so here's the question. 
But I, in, in each case, they were looking for the wrongs to be made right. Mm -hmm. And that, that's common even at the end when we want the wrongs to be made right. The question is, how will that happen? Okay. Because most of our Christian friends will tell us their interpretation of Revelation and other parts of the New Testament that things are gradually going to get better and better and better, and eventually we're going to have a golden age, which we call a millennium. Yeah. Others of us say, no, <coughs> the world is getting worse and worse and worse and worse, and the only way we're going to get to a golden age or anything close to a golden age is for God to come and clean up things here on this earth. That's a very different picture. Yeah, you know, I'm getting to see that, that that picture is shifting to things going worse and worse and worse because... You know, I, I was talking to somebody about Disneyland, Tomorrowland. When they first put it out, it was all a very positive look at the future. And now they need, they're, they're kind of seeing what to do with it again because it doesn't, things just, people don't believe it anymore. So, you know, that I think that everybody is getting to think that maybe they're having a second look at this nice better stuff. and better thing. My sister had an interesting comment. She doesn't really go to church nor read the Bible. She thinks a lot, and she says, you know, I don't think Jesus is going to come back and set foot on this earth. She says, we are just too awful. I think we're going to go up and meet him. Mm. And I thought, how interesting. I told her, I says, well, that's what the Bible says, that we're going to go up and meet him. He's not going to step foot on earth until he recreates it yeah. th on the third coming. So isn't that interesting? In her mind, we were getting so polluted that he could not come back and step foot. So do we, uh, do we all agree on which way the, the earth is going? Genetic entropy. <laughs> Genetic entropy. It's, it's, it's for real. <laughs> okay. And would you like to spell out what you mean by genetic entropy? Well, the deterioration of the genomes of, of, the, of human life, I mean, all life, I guess. Yeah. It's, uh, Things tend to decay. Yeah. Well, go into now chaos. science says it's getting better. Yeah. You read about science, and it has glowing predictions of the future. That's we're going to keep losing more species, and more keeps dying. The, well, we're gonna, the we're problems gonna, keep getting worse. We're going to figure out your whole genome, brother. And we're going to figure out how to test it, and we're going to know in advance exactly which diseases you're going to have. Good and so, luck. And we're going to Good be able luck. to fix it. <laughs> and we're going to be able to bring back species that have Memo died out. Technology. Yeah, I right. Mean, they can't even that. That. keep going what the ones we have in yeah, <laughs> a know. good enough state. Well, <clears throat> what is it that God actually wants to happen? Now, we realize that we don't have too many good examples of that here. What did God want to accomplish through writing all of these books? He Trying to get the attention of the kids. He wanted the kids. population sure to, to, to depend on him so that he could be their God and they could be his people. Okay, and what did he, what did he expect from them? What did he want to happen? What did he want them to do? You know, trust them. Trust him. Okay, and what but, would that but mean? But you gotta, you got to remember, though, that there was accusations against God. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what all this that we're going through is to find out what the answers really are. Okay. And Israel was supposed to take this message to the whole world, mm -hmm. yeah. just as we are. Mm -hmm. right. Did they do their job? No. Are we doing our job? No. <laughs> we're trying, well, some well, of us. But, but, but look at this for a moment. Let, let, let's be very honest. We read a little sort of introduction to the book of Zephaniah and some of the other books as well. God is saying, what I want is for you to love me, but then that love needs to be expressed to other people around you. Yep. How much of that's happening? How often do we say, if someone's not being treated fairly, okay, I'm, I'm going to get involved here, I'm going I'm to try to fi fix things, I'm going to try to help the people who are, who are hurting, I'm going to help the people who, are, who, who have no money, in, in, maybe in some cases, uh, what are we doing? It's supposed to be, we're supposed to be acting here, getting ready for heaven. As mm -hmm. it is done in heaven, we are supposed to be those kind of citizens here on earth, getting involved and helping others. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you need to value God, you need to value His creation, which was a gift to us. Um, 
you can't command that. How in the world are you going to learn to value God unless we go through what's going on here? Okay. I think I could value God without having to go through this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't I know. I really you do. Can say that, but uh, no. will you really value Him? I think we've gotten comfortable here. It's too yeah. easy. When you look at what's just happened in Hungary, they've brought in a constitution that is almost as bad as a communist. Yeah. They're blowing up Catholics in Nigeria. Another interesting side is they're Civil getting... Civil war in Syria. Yes, but they're getting more Christian books into China, which never was. Mm -hmm. So somewhere, things are still working. Well, to, to give us a little idea of the picture, the background, and what, what God's attitude was all of this, about all this, look at the last few verses, well, not the very last verses, but down close to the end. Second Chronicles chapter 36. I'm going to start reading from verse 13. Zedekiah rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, we've been talking about the Babylonians coming down. It was Nebuchadnezzar who came down three times that finally conquered Jerusalem and finally flattened it and took all the gold from the Solomon's temple, etc. Zedekiah rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar who had forced him to swear in God's name that he would be loyal. He stubbornly refused to repent and return to the Lord, the God of Israel. In addition, the leaders of Judah, the priests and the people, followed the sinful example of the nations around them in worshiping idols, and so they defiled the temple which the Lord himself had made holy. Now, we've already mentioned this, that they actually brought idols and things into Solomon's temple there. So what does God do? What does God do to people who, who do all those things? Well, look at the next two verses. The Lord, the God of their ancestors, had continued to send prophets to warn his people because he wanted to spare them and the temple. Did God want to give up on them? Did he want to see Solomon's temple destroyed? No. no. Not at all. He, no, that wasn't in God's plan. But they made fun of God's messengers, ignoring his words and laughing at his prophets, until at last the Lord's anger against his people was so great that there was no escape. Now, we would never do anything like that in our day, would we? So he uses the heathen nations to come in and do the disciplining of the... And do, do we need the atheists to come in and discipline Christians in our day? How about some misguided so-called Christians? <laughs> That's another possibility. That's another possibility. But it is... He, he does use the mechanism of allowing heresies in the church so that the church can be purified. Mm -hmm. Those who, well, Ephesians 4, those who get blown about by every wind of doctrine will get blown away. Yeah. So have we been purified yet? Is it working? Doesn't seem to be working, doesn't seem to be down to that level yet. Mm. I think there are some who are. I, I think there are people who who have had a total transformation yeah. and who really are dedicated at a level that we haven't seen before. Yeah. Yes. In every denomination. Yeah. So you should have probably said some people in the church will yes. be purified. Okay. Not well, necessarily the church. We, we're just about time for a break here. Don't go away. We're going to talk about a time, another time, which came several hundred years or a couple hundred years later and see what happened, how much has the attitude changed. Don't go away.
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stay by. We're going to take a quick look at a short book, the only book in the Bible with just two chapters, the little book of Haggai. Um, and that little book, what do we know about when it came? Well, Haggai comes at the same time as Zechariah. Now, we'll talk about Zechariah next week, but Haggai um, was an older prophet. He worked with Zechariah, who was a younger prophet. And these two men showed up on the scene about 520 BC. Now, the previous people we've been talking about, Zephaniah was around 610, 605 BC. So now we're talking about, what is this, 80 years later, something like that? Haggai comes along. Babylonian captivity is over. Well, it, they, they, at least they were allowed to go home if they wanted to. Only a f small percentage of them went home. They, they, they went back. They arrived in Jerusalem. The place was a total shambles, nothing but rubbish and, and trees growing up and, and a real mess. And one of the first things they did is, well, said, you know, we really want to serve God. Let's build ourselves a temple. And so they went up there on the mount and they started to clean things off and tried. They put up an altar so they could offer sacrifices. And almost immediately, the people around them began opposing them, doing everything possible to stop them from, from you know, building this or doing anything or even establishing their place, opposing them, opposing them, opposing them. These are the non-Jews? These are the non-Jews. wouldn't leave this little group of Jews that came back from exile alone? Yes, exactly. So, Are you surprised at that? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> no. I would think they'd leave them alone for a while. Well, no one was using that land. Without, well, no, they would have probably been happy to expand themselves into that land if, if, it, weren't if it weren't occupied. Um, about 16 years went by after they had gone back, 15 or 16 years after they, this small group had gone back to Jerusalem. They had become discouraged because everything they tried to do was opposed. They had no city wall. They had no city, really. There was no temple. It seemed like, you know, they had given up. They would go and each one of them were going and building, like, fairly nice houses for themselves, but they had sort of given up on any community kind of projects. In the year 520 B.C., in fact, with, with the book of Haggai and Zechariah, you can date these events right down to the day almost, in some cases, you can. August 29 of 520 B.C., Haggai uh, started his work. And let me read his very first words here. <coughs> During the second year that Darius was emperor of Is Persia, on the first day of the sixth month, the Lord spoke through the prophet Haggai. The message was for the governor of Judah, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and for the high priest Joshua, son of Jehozadak. Now, the two, well, the 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 political leader was uh, Zerubbabel, or sometimes called Sheshbashar, uh, and the spiritual leader was Joshua, the high priest. So these are the two men. So Haggai addresses himself to them, and we have the exact date. He addresses them again on September 15, which was, what, 16 days later, 17, 18 days later. He addressed them again on October 17, and by December 18, things had started to happen, and the people aroused themselves. Zechariah and Haggai caused a, a, a really a reformation, and the people all came together and they worked together, and over a period of four years, they rebuilt the temple there in Jerusalem, and they didn't let anything stop them. And it wasn't, wasn't nothing like Solomon's temple, but at least it was a temple, it was functional, it was, it was complete, it was intact, and, and God celebrated with them. There's uh, some very interesting comments about that, about Haggai and his work. Let me just read this introduction from the Message Bible. Places of worship are a problem, and the problem does not seem to be architectural. Grand Gothic cathedrals that dominate a city don't ensure that the worship of God dominates that city. Unpainted, ramshackle, clapboard sheds perched precariously on the edge of a prairie don't guarantee a congregation of humble saints in Denham. As we look over the centuries of the many and various building projects in God's name, wilderness tabernacle, revival tent, Gothic cathedral, wayside chapel, synagogue, temple, meeting house, storefront mission, the catacombs, 
there doesn't seem to be any connection between the buildings themselves and the belief and behavior of the people who assemble in them. And noticing this, it is not uncommon for us to be dismissive of the buildings themselves by saying, a place of worship is not a building, it is people. Or, I prefer worshiping God in the great cathedral of the outdoors. These pronouncements are often tagged with the scriptural punchline, the God who made the universe doesn't live, live in custom-made shrines, which is supposed to end the discussion. God doesn't live in buildings, period. That's what we often say. But then there's Haggai to count for. Haggai was dignified with the title prophet. Therefore, we must take him seriously. His single task, carried out in a three and a half month mission, was to get God's people to work at rebuilding God's temple, the same temple that had been destroyed by God's decree only 70 or so years earlier. Compared with the great prophets who preach repentance and salvation, Haggai's message doesn't sound very spiritual. But in God's economy, it is perhaps unwise to rank our assigned work as either more or less spiritual. We are not angels. We inhabit space, material, bricks, and mortal, mortar, boards, and nails. Keep us grounded and connected with the ordinary world in which we necessarily live out our extraordinary beliefs. Haggai uh, keeps us in touch with those times in our lives when repairing the building where we worship is an act of obedience every bit as important as praying in that place of worship. So obviously Haggai and Zechariah, their challenge was to reform the people, but to, in the process, get this temple built. And look at the first few verses. Um, I'm going to see, well, let's read up to verse 8. During the second year that Darius was emperor of Persia, we, we looked at this already, on the first day of the sixth month, the Lord spoke to the prophet Haggai, the message was, and so forth. Drop down to verse 2. The Lord Almighty said to Haggai, These people say that this is not the right time to rebuild the temple. The Lord then gave this message to the people through the prophet Haggai. My people, why should you be living in well-built houses while my temple lies in ruins? Don't you see what is happening to you? You have planted much grain, but have harvested very little. You have food to eat, but enough to, not enough to make you full. You have wine to drink, but not enough to get drunk on. You have clothing, but not enough to keep you warm, and workers cannot earn enough to live on. Can't you see why this has happened? Now go up into the hills, get lumber, rebuild the temple, then I will be pleased and will be worshipped as I should be. So what are we supposed to learn from that? Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. How many, how many church building programs have been started with those verses? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, isn't this kind of a... Kind of a uh, a feeling or a, a statement of bringing God's presence into them, mm -hmm. so that they would they would reap the rewards of His presence, mm -hmm. type of thing. Right now, they didn't care about it; they just did whatever they needed for their their um, homes and whatever, and they didn't think much about God. Well, every time they tried to do something, they were whatever they tried to do was burnt down or attacked or destroyed by their enemies. So finally, you just give up. So it turned out to be easier just to go build your own house and mm -hmm. there wasn't seem to be that so much problem with doing that. It's almost like somebody trying to force in that direction. Mm -hmm. They didn't, didn't really have their priorities straight there, did they? No. Is God got comfy first. Yeah. Is God saying that you only have small harvests, you don't really have enough to eat because you haven't given me priority in your life? And mm -hmm. that if you do these things, you will have bigger harvests and you will be more content. I mean, isn't that sort of prosperity theology? Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things, prosperity, will be added unto you. But you're still so let me that. see if I can analyze that. That means if I worship in an expensive church, I'll be better off. I can drive a Mercedes. Didn't say that. You didn't say that. 
I'm not sure right. that seeking God necessarily means that. If if building that up becomes a big piece of pride on your life, and you and you're like the Jews, you say, "Look at that mighty building," instead of realizing that you are nothing, and your relationship with God is what keeps you going moment by moment. You've missed the point. Okay, it's so, almost like he's saying, though, you know, you've done all this work, you do all this stuff, and and nothing hardly comes out of it and yet you're telling you. yourself that you should be satisfied with that you know you shouldn't be satisfied with that there's there must be some sort of way to increase and he's saying bring me into the picture Look like at jesus this. did when he was out there all night playing with his father talking with him getting the instruction it says he made no plans for himself he got all of instructions on what to do day by day from the Father. Would you call that a walk of faith? I'd call that a walk of faith. But still, those plans became his plans. Mm -hmm. And it, it started feeling like his plans. When he did exactly as he wanted to do, he was doing the will of the Father. Well, because he'd already checked out the will of the Father. And Absolutely. And what he found out was doing the will of the Father turns out to be the right thing to do. Isn't How that amazing? That? How about that? <laughs> Joanne, did you want to comment? Well, um, in verse 10, Therefore, because of you, the sky has withheld its dew, the earth has withheld its produce. I called for a drought on the land, on the mountains, on the grain, on the new wine, the old, and what the ground produces, on men, on cattle, on all your labor of your hands. So when God's not with you, it doesn't seem like you get very far. Is God unless, the de unless the devil promotes you. Yeah. And if, if he can get you by promoting you, he'll do it. Yeah. But they were still getting enough to live, you know. But they, well, they thought, didn't. that's it. I mean, just be satisfied with it. That's all we're getting. Mm -hmm. God says, no, no, you don't have to do that. Does this sound like God is sort of pouting a little bit? If you won't do it my way, I'm, I'm not going to send you rain. I'm not going to bless your cows and your sheep. And No, I'm just saying that they're giving up too easily. I mean, like you just said, you know, they tried all this stuff, but it was too hard. Mm -hmm. So it must not be God's will, right? Mm -hmm. So let's go do the, let's build our houses. Oh, that's going real well. That must be God's will. Another yeah. thing God may be saying <laughs> is, I have principles to live by. And if you live by these principles, which is to build my church and to meet together as a community, life will go better for you as a group of people because you're doing uh, my way of life and you'll all work together and um, things will go better. Could he be saying that my way of life, you're, you're missing my way of life? Hmm. Sounds like it, doesn't it? It <laughs> sounds like, does heaven sound like it would be a better way than what we have here? Yes. Now, just a minute. <laughs> we, well, but that, yeah. his way is yeah. the way it happens up exactly. there. Exactly, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it would happen that down here if, it was, if we did it his way because if Israel had fulfilled their message and it had developed the relation with God that he wanted them to, they would have prospered and earth would have gone back to its Edenic beauty. You know, it's funny. We just talked about faith where everything was so bad that it was hard to have faith. And now you've got things that are bad, and God's trying to get them to have faith to have a better life. So try it's, anything they were kind of mm -hmm. well. I I think it's just he's just demonstrating the range of where faith goes. Yeah. It's not it's just good. that it's bouncing around. He's just showing us all that. Now now let's let's we we're we're doing a the bird's eye view of the Bible. Now we've been through all this. We're taking a quick look at it. We know that God has foreknowledge. He knows what's going to happen. Now we're talking 520 B.C. here. 500 years later, 540, 50 years later, Jesus is going to come. They're going to reject him. They're going to crucify him. Why does he bother? If he knows that's what's, ha going, what's coming, why, why does he bother with them? Doesn't it seem like... You know? Because what he's bothering is in that plan, too. I mean, out, teacher, out of, I mean how would you... Yeah, out of that plan, out of that 550 years later, grew the Christian church. Uh -huh. And we're doing so good today. Yeah, of course. Well, maybe <laughs> we aren't, but uh, <laughs> at least it was 
there was some good that came out of it. Okay. Well, you know, patient, uh, God wants his people to be patient, long-suffering, do good. And God is modeling that behavior. He is being so patient with a rebellious group. Mm -hmm. It's almost like you're going, God, aren't you just going to give up? Mm -hmm. This whole book is failure after failure of, our, mm -hmm. of the people. There's a very interesting verse that we have to talk about before we run out of time. It's chapter 2. I'm going to start with verse 6, but the real verse I want to talk about is verse 9, just to get a little bit of background. Haggai 2, I'm going to start with verse 6. Before long I will shake heaven and earth, land and sea. I will overthrow all the nations and their treasures will be brought here and the temple will be filled with wealth. And all the Jews said, Yay. Amen. Amen. <laughs> right? All the silver and gold of the world is mine. And again they said, Amen. Amen. Preach it, brother. But, but notice what comes next. The new temple... Now, actually, I guess we should back up a little bit and say, what happened when, when they all gathered around? If you go back to Ezra, they, they took one look at this <laughs> new temple. The people who'd seen the previous temple, yeah. they're crying and weeping. Look at this little pitiable, pitiful thing. I mean, Solomon's temple was here, and we, we messed up and we lost it. And now look at this, you know, humble shack that we have here now. And what did God say? Verse 9, the new temple will be more splendid, or some versions more glorious, than the old one. And there I will give my people prosperity and peace. The Lord Almighty has spoken. Now here's my question. How, in what way, was this new temple ever going to be more glorious? Now before you say anything, let me just remind you of a couple of things. Go back to the last two verses in Exodus. Go back to the last two verses in Exodus. Actually, it's um, starting with verse 34. Exodus 40, verse 34. Now they built the tabernacle in the wilderness now, and it says, Then the cloud covered the tent, and the dazzling light of the Lord's presence filled it. Because of this, Moses could not go into the tent. I mean, this is Moses who had spent 80 days with God up in the mountain and came down with his face shining so bright they couldn't look at him. And now he can't even go into the tent, okay? The Israelites moved to the camp and so forth and so forth. Now, go to um, 2 Kings 8. Hold on. It's, no, it would be 1 Kings 8, I'm sorry. So that was God filling the tent tabernacle in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. Yes, filling it with his glory now. Now, if you go to the time when they built Solomon's temple, um, see if I can spot. We come to 1 Kings 8. I think actually we need to look at the, because this story is told here, and it's also told over in 2 in, uh, Chronicles, Chronicles 6. I'm sorry. Is it 2 Chronicles 6 or 7? Jump over to 2 Chronicles 6 or 7 with me. Yeah. It's actually the last verses of 5 is what I'm looking for. Start with verse 11. We're, we're talking about 2 Chronicles 5 verse 11. Now we talked about the dedication of the tent out in the wilderness. Now we're talking about the dedication of Solomon's temple. All the priests present, regardless of the group to which they belonged, had consecrated themselves, and all the Levite musicians, Asaph, Heman, and Jeduthun, and the members of their clans were wearing linen clothing. The Levites stood near the east side of the altar with cymbals and harps, and with them were 120 priests playing trumpets. Their singers were accompanied in perfect harmony by trumpets, cymbals, and other instruments as they praised the Lord, singing, Praise the Lord, because He is good, and His love is eternal. And what's the result? As the priests were leaving the temple, it was suddenly filled with the clouds shining with the dazzling light of the Lord's presence, and they could not continue the service of worship. So God's presence did what again? Filled the temple with glory. It filled the temple with glory. What happened in the days of Haggai and Zechariah? You know, it looks like, it looks like those two examples that you just yeah. uh, did first is kind of a, a glory of our expectations. Mm -hmm. If you really think no, about no, no, it, be careful. It's God who's doing yeah, this. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. But He can give 
whatever glory you, you want, this whatever you want to do, but it looks like the small temple is going to have glory from a different angle. Well, so what's the different angle? That, well, didn't Jesus, Jesus walk down through down that? Yeah, at the didn't that dusty human that didn't own anything, but, but Solomon's didn't have temple any power? was covered with gold and it was built with marble. Now tell me, when this little temple was finished, did the um, Shekinah glory come into it no. or not? No. Nope. And the ark was never there? None of the instruments, well, maybe later, some of them, we don't know for sure, but basically nothing was in this temple. All the good stuff had been, it was gone. And God still said that that temple was going to be... More glorious. And my question is, why is it more glorious? Because oh, Herod made it better. Well, Jesus well, was... <laughs> Herod spent a lot of Caesar's money to, to improve the temple. That's true. That's is that true. the reason? How much teaching and listening did the children of Israel do in the, at the tent tabernacle and in Solomon's temple, as opposed to how much listening did they do to Jesus when he was here on this earth in this temple, in this pitiful temple. Well, what do we know about that? That's a good question. Well, can you answer it? Yeah. <laughs> well, where would we go to look for an answer? I want a clue. Well, let, let, let's, put the, let's put things in context. It turns out that there were more than twice as many sacrifices offered at the dedication of Solomon's temple than there were Jews in attendance at this dedication. They sacrificed twice as many animals on that one occasion than all the Jews that were present at this dedication. At, at the, at the uh, new small This time of Zechariah and Haggai. It was a yeah. real bloodbath, you really think about Back in Solomon's day. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, but here there's a, a pity. I mean, they bring a few hundred sheep. Okay, Lord? And he says, what kind of an offering is that? I'm used to hundreds of thousands, right? Well, he also I said mean, he was tired of that kind of stuff too, so. Isaiah 1, Amos mm -hmm. 5, all that kind of stuff, right? But were the people more dedicated in this small, humble temple, or were they? I don't think so, well, because they all temple, had their problems. If this temple ends up being the property, the so-called habitat, of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, would you say this is a wonderful, glorious thing to God's, to God's glory? No. No? no. They prostituted it in the end. So where's the glory? Well, it's when Jesus walked in. He walked in, in as the Shekinah glory, but he walked in in a human body, so people could not see the Shekinah glory dusty, as he walked in. A poor body. But the Shekinah glory did visit that temple in um, the form of a God taken on human flesh. It was a human teaching. that knew a lot about oh, God. Oh, teaching? teaching? So the teaching in that temple by Jesus was ever more potent than the other two temples? Oh, I see what you're getting at now. Yeah, so do I. <laughs> it wasn't just Jesus being there. Mm -hmm. It was teaching. the way God communicated with mankind in this new temple that Haggai built 500 years later. 500 years later that, uh, yeah. that they, he com got well, communicated Think about with this. What do we know about Jesus' experience in Jerusalem? He's rejected. He was ultimately rejected by the priests and the Sadducees and so forth. But what did, what did Jesus do when he came to Jerusalem on different occasions? He taught. Okay, and, and, and how did he go about doing that? Because, you know, almost from the beginning of his life, in, in, in the very early part of his ministry, the Pharisees were out to kill him. And yet he kept coming back to the temple. So how did he protect his life for those three and a half years? He taught in parables? Yeah, but... He kept, he kept away from it quite often. He moved around. He moved around, but he kept coming back to the temple. What would he well, do? Well, somebody was, something was protecting him. What was it that was protecting him? You better tell us. We're running out of time. <laughs> <laughs> he did it in public. Okay, if yeah. you read, yeah. There was large groups of people there. Yeah. yeah. And Witnesses. when the large groups of people were there, the priests wouldn't interfere. And what would happen? If you go back and look carefully at the stories, when Jesus was in Jerusalem, he would arrive very early in the morning at the temple and almost immediately people start gathering around him and he, was he would start teaching. 
And then the Pharisees and the Sadducees were afraid to come and attack him because they would be in turn attacked by the people who wanted to hear what he had to say. He would fill up those outside courts of the temple with hundreds and maybe thousands of people wanting to hear what he had to say. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees, all they could do was stand by and and get, they couldn't do anything. And get angry. And stand get by angry. And get angry. Exactly. Oh, they that's, just, that's why just, they had to get him at night when he right. was alone. Yeah, that's what they him. finally figured out. We, we've got to get him sometime when he's not near the temple and no one's around and we've got to catch him all by himself. And then we can do our thing. Hmm. Ellen White has some very interesting words to say about this passage in, in, in Haggai and what I've just told you. They're actually found in a couple of places. Um, the Great Controversy, page 24, I think it starts at the bottom of 23, actually. For centuries, the Jews had vainly endeavored to show wherein the promise of God given by Haggai had been fulfilled. How can we explain these words? Yet pride and unbelief blinded their mind to the true meanings of the prophet's words. The second temple was not honored with the cloud of Jehovah's glory, but with the living presence of one in whom dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily, who was God himself manifested in the flesh. Dropping down in the presence of Christ, and in this only did the second temple exceed the first in glory. And then one other place, for centuries, learned men have endeavored to show wherein the promise of God given to Haggai has been fulfilled. Yet in the advent of Jesus of Nazareth, the desire of all nations who by his personal presence hallowed the precincts of the temple, many have steadfastly refused to see any special significance. Pride and unbelief have blinded their minds to the true meaning of the prophet's words. Mm. Now let's think about this. We as human beings are wowed by gold and magnificent temples and marble and, and ivory and all that kind of stuff that was in those Solomon's temple. And we, I'm sure it would be odd if we saw God's presence come down and filling the temple with, with glory. But God says, better than that, better than all of that, is to have a quiet man, maybe in dusty, dirty clothes, sit down and explain the kingdom of God and quiet but clear revelation of the truth about God. The, the, the dusty Jesus, with his explanations about what God is all about, there in the temple to thousands of people, was the kind of glory that God tells us about. And that's what we should be doing. Not out there making big splashes, but quietly telling our friends what God is like. That's the kind of glory that God wants to fill his temples with. See you next week.